doing what uh, in Max we are doing with uh, performance modeling and how to predict uh, the performance of quantum stress. Cerco di stringere. Ok, can you hear me? Ok, fine. Okay, so thank you, Carlo, and um, well, thanks also for the opportunity to present uh, the results that we obtained while working on the uh, creation of a performance model for quantum espresso. Um, this is an, um, an activity done in the context of uh, hardware software co-design, and uh, for those of you, the few in the audience that are not familiar with this kind of task, let me just briefly introduce what hardware software co-design here is. Uh, well, actually, uh, let me just mimic <laughs> our uh, co-design meeting might be. Of course, for obvious reasons, I have to go back in time uh, and suppose that is uh, more or less eight years ago and for example, in a co-design session with Intel, I'm introduced to a new architecture which has 1.4 gigahertz cores, but new vector instructions and 64 cores per node. And, uh, and this gives uh, three teraflops, double precisions. And, uh, and also this kind of architecture has uh, an interesting solution for uh, memory uh, for and uh, more precisely high bandwidth memory so probably uh, most of you have recognized that i'm talking about knl and during this session the question i might be asked to uh, address is uh, how can quantum express exploit this architecture this architecture uh, and more importantly probably uh, so what for a workload that fit this kind of architecture, uh, how many gigabytes of this new high bandwidth memory uh, would be needed, would be uh, really exploited by quantum espresso? So to answer this kind of questions, a very useful tool is, uh, of course, a performance model. So performance modeling is a strategy to evaluate design option and system sizes of course, design options also of software, and uh, it is generally used in core design to make uh, prediction on the efficacy of a new architecture, but also to monitor uh, the possible hotspots and bottlenecks that may show up in an application as the hardware is changing, is evolving. And, uh, uh, and of course, avoid this certainly longer uh, performance testing. Uh, but it is very useful, it could be very useful also in the context of code development. So first of all, to understand where there is room for improvement. So where uh, the code is not giving the expected uh, performances in terms of flops or in terms of access to, to memory. Uh, and uh, uh, again, to monitor uh, uh, with the evolution of hardware uh, where hotspot might be in the future, and again, to avoid the longer testing of performances. And finally, it can also be a good instrument for users uh, because with the model, we can predict in advance how long the simulation will take. We can, in principle, also 
prepare uh, strategies to auto tune the parallel parameters of the code and get the best out of the hardware that is running the code. And another point, which is uh, not linked to code design, but uh, it's quite important, it's that it's an important tool also for the uh, user that want to understand their, uh, the, how long their scientific study will take on a given machine. So uh, to create a performance model that could answer, uh, at least in part, to these problems, uh, <coughs> we started focusing on uh, the PW kernel. And uh, we targeted, in this first stage, a single modern HPC node. What I, what I mean with this is a node with tens of cores and gigabytes, uh, tens of gigabytes of RAM. And more precisely, uh, in this presentation, I will um, present the result obtained on the Broadwell core and on the Xeon 5 processor, uh, which, OK. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, has been, uh, it will be no longer uh, followed by a new architecture, but still interesting to check what the model will give also on this uh, processor. So um, let's go a bit into the details. Um, the total execution time of a single MPI process may be approximated with the sum of some components, one connected to the time taken by MPI communication, another component taken, uh, sorry, uh, being the input-output time, and finally, the rest, the remaining part of the code. All these uh, elements are influenced by a certain number of parameters. It can be the network bandwidth, the uh, bandwidth towards the memory. This is, for example, the case of MPI collective communications, uh, of course, the core execution is influenced by the memory, uh, bandwidth, by the frequency. Of course, by no means this, this is complete. And of course, all these parameters, the time taken by all these uh, components, depends on the input file. So in literature I've seen, uh, well, not really in literature, but in, <laughs> in the examples that I've seen of performance models, uh, I have collected two kind of approaches. Uh, one is uh, collecting information on the application on a reference system and uh, dividing the various uh, uh, parts of the application and, uh, let's say, uh, divide the influence of a set of um, parameters uh, to send in the hardware in uh, uh, these uh, in this uh, expansion shown here with the uh, alpha uh, um, variables. Uh, so the, the, the time taken for the execution of the application on a new architecture uh, can be estimated by uh, using this uh, splitting of the execution time uh, and uh, pro uh, multiplying these factors for the relevant changes in the hardware details. For example, uh, the MPI may be, uh, may be improving if the network bandwidth increases with respect to the reference uh, network bandwidth, and so on. Now, the good thing about this approach is that uh, there are only a few parameters to take into account, and uh, they can be modeled with some uh, experiments by varying the uh, various uh, hardware details, but the better thing with this approach is that uh, the predictive power of uh, these models is limited. So usually they don't provide uh, good absolute time prediction as the hardware evolves. And uh, of course, there is the need to repeat the analysis, the analysis, the whole analysis, uh, when the code changes, uh, when there are major changes in the code. The second approach is instead to divide the application into kernels and estimate uh, the time taken by each kernel with the relevant variables, uh, hardware and input variables, for the given kernel, and then add all the time, uh, so compute the time taken by all the kernels taken into account, and then of course there will be something that is left out for a series of reasons. It's uh, too complicated to estimate, or it's 
not worth estimating this remaining time. Uh, so the good thing about this approach is that in general it produces much better absolute time predictions, but of course there's the drawback that you have to analyze each kernel and go through the details of the code execution. So as I said, uh, we wanted really to provide a system uh, and a model to obtain uh, absolute, inf uh, absolute time information on the execution of PW, so we went through this second uh, approach. And the first step that we took is, of course, the code uh, profiling. We did this uh, for both uh, PW and Quantum Espresso and Yambo, uh, while uh, uh, the model is instead only available for PW at the moment, but I will show some details anyway. Uh, so PW, uh, most of these results have already been presented by Massimiliano Fatica uh, at the beginning of this session. So uh, what I'm showing here is uh, the best uh, execution time on a uh, uh, KNL node. And uh, what you observe is that the, the best time to solution is obtained with a pure MPI implementation. And the pure MPI implementation takes quite some part of the uh, whole uh, time to solution. So it's almost slightly less than 30% of the time. And most of the communication are uh, collective communication. And uh, these are more or less uh, the communication that are involved in uh, FFT, parallel FFT, and uh, parallel diagonalization. When you consider instead the blue part, uh, the time is mostly spent in three kernels. As I said, I'm more or less repeating what has already been presented, so I don't want to enter, don't want to spend too much time on this. It's general uh, matrix matrix multiplications, diagonalization, and FFT. Um, so this tells me that uh, if I want to understand and model the performances of PW, I have to really take into account uh, collective communication and these uh, three kernels. Uh, and this is indeed what we have done. But before showing the, the, these details, I want to present a very different case. Um, this is the case of Yambo, where instead time uh, for a, a single node execution is, um, well, MPI time is almost absent, and it's all MPI barriers. So this tells me that uh, in this case, synchronization is the issue. I mean, not really an issue because it's just 10% of the time. But in this case, I would focus on synchronization and uh, load balance. And instead, what uh, this uh, analysis of bandwidth memory uh, usage is showing is that the code is uh, uh, somehow uh, bandwidth memory bound. So and this is slightly different from what we observed uh, in the case of uh, quantum express where DGEM were a sizable part of the execution and are compute bound. So as I said earlier, these are the kernels that we focus on. So the parallel FFT, uh, and by this I mean uh, FFT uh, kernels, so 1D FFTs, MPI all-to-all -all communication, and uh, the memory access, which uh, happens when there is a scatter between the processors and the zeroing out of some variables. So matrix multiplications uh, and the diagonalization can. Uh, at this stage, it is only a serial diagonal diagonalization. And finally, unbalance is considered only in the distribution of K points. So the step two is, as I said earlier, uh, counting the operations. So to do this, I went through the code and uh, uh, just uh, collected the number of flops that are done as a function of the input parameters. Uh, I want just very briefly uh, mm, report that, uh, of course, you may uh, use hardware counters to do this, but there is there is also there are also projects going towards uh, the analysis of the source code and providing an estimate of the floating point operations from the source code, and this could be an option to keep in mind maybe in the future. But the second part uh, is how to describe the machine, the hardware parameters. So this is by far the most complex part. 
And we soon realized that we couldn't just get a list of values from the vendors, like CPU frequency, cache, size, and so on. And to convince you about this, I will briefly show an example. This is a, a um, um, parallel uh, um, benchmark of memory bandwidth. This is a, a Broadway core. It looks nice, very nice picture with drops where L1, L2, and L3 caches uh, are full. And uh, this is the same picture as a function of the number of uh, cores. It's case as expected. Uh, and what you observe here is that, as expected, at a certain point, you reach a saturation. It's every final. I don't want to go into the details. I'm just showing that uh, if you repeat this thing on a KNL, uh, well, the picture is slightly different, but still you understand what is going on. While uh, with the growing number of cores, the thing gets a little bit more messy, but probably it's messy because uh, I didn't went really into the details of the benchmarking. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to highlight that the, the bandwidth here as a function of our processor is increasing and keeps increasing because of caching, and that's indeed what is expected. But Still, we cannot just get the number from the vendor. It's much more complex, and the same holds true for the software part. If we want to be and to be able to have a prediction and an accurate prediction, by accurate I mean in the order of 10%, uh, when Quantum Express operates in this part of the uh, FFT dimensions, so. Uh, you immediately see that uh, the performance of the FFT really depends on the implementation and on the size of the, uh, of the data. So uh, it became clear that we needed an additional layer between the uh, performances and the hardware. So this is indeed what we have done. The model, uh, as of today, takes into account uh, the number of operations by just counting the dimension of the matrix multiplications of the FFT of the diagonalization, reading PW input files, uh, and input files and pseudo potential, of course, uh, while instead the details of the hardware are uh, abstract and are obtained with micro benchmarks, which in some cases are easy to connect to the details of the hardware, DGEM, for example. In some other cases, are not so straightforward, but still, this gives us the flexibility to work on this uh, micro benchmark and do the projection on the results on the micro benchmark and still keep the accuracy on the uh, total time, uh, absolute total time estimate when needed. So, okay, so I'm showing uh, a few results here. So this is a, a bulk material, uh, 64 atoms, uh, 14K points, uh, running on an increasing number of uh, MPI uh, processes. Uh, on the left side, Broadwell architecture. On the right side, KNL architecture. So the blue uh, bar is uh, the true uh, execution time. The orange bar is the estimate provided by the model. Uh, if you remember, I said earlier that we only consider a certain number of kernels. So uh, actually, this that seems a perfect match, it's not, because we forgot about what's out of the uh, kernels that I'm considering. So I'm having here an estimate for what the rest might be and how it contributes. So this 15% come from an estimate of was not taken into account by the kernels that I'm considering. Uh, and of course, there is the implicit assumption that uh, uh, the remaining part of the code behaves as the kernel that I'm considering. So the, what you actually should compare is the blue bar with the yellow bar. And uh, well, the accuracy is of the order of uh, 10%. And I did it with a slightly different material. So the first one was a bulk material, three-dimensional material. This is uh, on a bi-dimensional material, slightly larger, um, and still the agreement uh, is not bad. Uh, that, of course, uh, there are situations where 
the unbalance is not described so uh, accurately, but uh, uh, the, the nice thing I wanted to show is that for, the, uh, for, for, for providing information in the context of co-design, this model already gives important information like, for example, the comparison between Brodel and KNL. What you, what you see here on the left and on the right is the uh, ratio between the time to solution uh, obtained on a Broadwell core and on a KNL core running on the Broadwell and on the KNL uh, running with a certain number of MPI on the Broadwell and with twice as much MPI processes on the KNL. So here are running up to 32 MPI processes on the Broadwell and 64, so this data is for 64 <laughs> MPI processes on the KNL. What you see here, what you observe here, is that going from 4 to 32, you cross the 1, and the model uh, predicts this crossing slightly higher value, but still you observe this advantage of using Broadwell and KNL for a given number of processes. So, well, the conclusion is that, uh, well, the job was actually rather straightforward. I just had to identify the relevant kernels, and the tricky part was to dig into the code and construct the right uh, subroutine call tree. And I believe that another important information is that uh, uh, this approach that at the beginning we thought was quite long and difficult proved to be rather uh, straightforward. I mean, th this preliminary result, these are by no means complete, but this preliminary result pr were done in about three weeks, so it didn't take that much. And with the code evolution, we could really think that following the code evolution, it doesn't take that much time. And uh, of course, these results have been useful and already shared in uh, co-design activities. But let me finish with uh, future and perspectives because uh, uh, we have many ideas on how to de deploy this system in uh, different use cases. So of course, we would like to expand this model to uh, parallel organization, task groups, better unbalanced description, and, uh, and these are parts of model improvements, but after that, uh, of course, we are in contact with uh, Intel to uh, adjust and provide information starting working on the micro benchmarks to obtain uh, a description of the time to solution in future architecture. And of course, another idea that we hope will take place is the training of the model starting with AIDA level, so with high throughput calculations, and possibly the adoption of the model in AIDA for providing this mechanism of auto-tuning of the parallel performances and an estimate for a given workflow, for the time to solution of a given workflow. I think that uh, with this, I can thank you and thanks Max and Cineca for this work.